Hello my soccer universe, let's review the happenings over the past two weeks in Portugal and in Spain. I am wearing Benfica who are flying high having beaten Porto. I did an extra one minute video on that, that game, we'll talk way too late about this in this video, but that was the big one and I think after that game we clearly can tell that um, the Benfica are now the odds on favorite to win it all, they opened up a gap to their biggest um, rivals that I think will not be able to overcome and even the Champions League they look like a really really dangerous uh, team well structured it's a Roger Schmidt team uh, they can hurt you with all, not all uh, that much in there uh, unlike Portugal in Spain the league got a little bit tighter we'll talk about uh, the reasons why the, uh, the first reason is the Barcelona gets the wins no matter how they just get the wins and uh, Real Madrid is kind of hitting a slump and, and there's this big discussion you know uh, is it all due to the World Cup because of these teams they are not, not playing great but uh, all the big teams in Spain there's players going out uh, uh, earlier than you would expect and I think they're keeping if they have just a little knock they just don't want to be there because you know you might actually miss out on the World Cup if you keep playing and I think that that is a huge thing happening uh, there an interesting development for sure uh, to say but the league got tighter because Real Madrid uh, after the Clasico where they clearly showed that they are uh, the best team in Spain bar none they had so and so performances. I mean, they uh, got the pass Sevilla and then they dropped points at home to Girona. And yes, it was. I thought if this was a penalty, I didn't really see it. Um, I'm almost with Angel. It was an invented penalty. I love that expression. <laughs> uh, but yeah, with that drop points, I mean, Real Madrid is still first in the league and still very much the also favorites, but it's now only a point. And that might make things a whole lot more interesting. Uh, also interesting will be the situation developing Atletico Madrid uh, after their horror week, crashing out of the Champions League by missing in the last second. And now with the last kick of the game, uh, they lose at Loli Cadiz, which is also, you know, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that there's an imminent danger of um, Simeone being fired. However, it may turn out to be the end and it might be that uh, the big signing of Joao Felice is the one where he might stumble over because uh, it's not working. The guy is not happy. Uh, he's the biggest investment that the club ever did. He's an amazing talent. We all know that. Uh, but he's not a Simeone style player. So uh, what, what gives in a way? He almost turned that game around, but the keyword here is almost. And in the end, Atletico lose. So, <laughs> and uh, behind in the in the table, I think you know it's. I, I keep saying it's Barcelona, Real Madrid, Atletico cannot keep up, but probably get a third place. Sevilla, doom again back in the relegation zone, and uh, even the other Real Sociedad had a horrible two weeks, and uh, Betis cannot beat Atletico Madrid, although they probably should have if you had watched the game. So, you know, it's so and so. And um, Villarreal have a new coach in Kike Seyesetien, uh, as Una Emery is now uh, uh, going to England. So, yeah. But I want to start with O Clásico in Portugal. That's uh, way too late, uh, but it was definitely the biggest game that we had in these two weeks in there uh the big one in portugal uh, as well and it was a very very odd game because i felt especially in the first 15 minutes porto actually uh really went at benfica and benfica were reeling for a while um however it then really turned around when astakio uh within three minutes makes two stupid yellow uh card fouls and is uh duly sent off and that changed the dynamic of the game. It suddenly it deflated the game at first. Then Benfica um, had a good chance where they, uh, I think, hit twice the woodwork um, in one attacking move. Uh, and from that moment on, it almost seemed like it's only um, it's only a matter of time until Benfica actually will take the lead. But they were uh, missing some chances, um, and the game Porto kept it tight. And the game for many time uh, went then 
almost to a nil-nil until a nearish assist of Rafa Silva, who has been in amazing form, and we know from the Champions League, but uh, also, also in uh, Liga Portugal. He's doing really, really well. Gets the 1-0. Um, however, if you thought that this is it, and now Benfica will know. Porto actually had a few chances as well, so it was a very, very interesting tight game. Uh, but Benfica on the balance, the better team. However, I think this uh, red card for Estacchio was definitely a deciding factor in um, uh, Benfica winning that, that game because it changed the dynamic of the game rather, rather quickly. And I'm not saying it was a wrong card to give. It's just that this was for me the key moment of uh, that particular match. Um, Sporting also not really finding their groove. I mean, one nil down to Casa Pia at home, um, but then Paulinho, Santos, and uh, Pedro Gonzalez uh, turn it turn, turn around in the second half, get a three-one win. Braga also. I mean, Braga probably is could make it into the top three this season. The way that uh, especially Sporting is showing weaknesses, uh, they get a two-nil win at Sturil. Um and yeah. You see the other results. We, we uh, I think Gimaresh against Boavista, a kind of a derby 3 2, uh, looks like an interesting result. Uh, as as well, not seeing much. I it's a little bit sad. I sometimes would love to see, see, see more, but there's always some other games that excite me more in Port, Port Portugal. That, that's my big uh, problem. Porto continuing the bad run, uh, as the Sporting uh, on the last week, we get with a 1-1 at Santa Clara, they take an early lead, however, a uh, Ke uh, Kennedy Boateng, another Boateng, in the 83rd gets an equalizer for Santa Clara and Porto dropping again points and now um, it really uh, is all going Benfica's way. Uh, sporting losing at Aruca, also not good and then uh, to, hem to hammer at home, literally uh, five nil of Benfica over Chavez. Yeah, it's kind of expected, but you know, Neres, Grimaldo, Ramos, uh, Musa, uh, and Rafa Silva, of course, uh, scoring the five five goals, even having a goal this this, this last. So it all really really points towards Benfica. Uh, Gimares with another three two, and Braga winning one nil at Gilles Vicente, who had a good last last season. Were even uh, in the European qual qualification, but at the moment are struggling. Uh, especially when we look at the table, Gilles Vicente is down there. He's on the relegation spot, up top. I mean, it's a six point lead for Benfica over Braga. That looks decisive. It's also eight points over Porto. Uh, sporting only in sixth place. Casa Pia actually holding their own uh, out there, and so is Vittoria uh, the Gimaresh. Uh, but you know, I have to wait. I actually like to see Boavista uh, being high up there because they're also a very traditional team. But then there are others uh, that are on the bottom, and Passos uh, recently were also kind of a top team. But as always, when we uh, see in Portugal, the expected stand is you see this light green cloud. It is so close together. This is for me the most amazing part about the Portuguese league. Uh, it's not only the fact that there are only a handful of teams that ever have won the league. I think a total of four, because Boavista, I think, has won. So it's uh, Porto Sporting, um, Benfica, and Boavista. So that's one amazing fact about the port poor Portuguese league but the other one is that behind those uh when it's in the first league that we have here a clear relegation candidate in passos speaks is rather unusual because everything in midfield is so close together and i i'm always amazed at that but it's also, also clear that we have a clear one, a clear two, and now Sporting and Braga are rather level, um, with Braga holding a, a actually decent points advantage over Sporting, also six points. So uh, also quite in interesting, and maybe Braga can can break into the Champions League ranks. It would, 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 would be nice, although, you know, I think of the big three in uh, Portugal, I probably like Sporting the most. Uh, I give you the upcoming two rounds. Uh, we have Sporting against Guimaraes. That's that's I think the big one there. Uh, yeah, late kick of time. Maybe maybe I, I'll watch it. Um, uh, Sturil has to play Benfica. Uh, Porto against Passos. Um, 
and uh, Braga against Casa P is also a top game. And then uh, just before the World Cup, yes, we're already in two weeks. We're having the last rounds ahead of the, of the, of the World Cup. Um, we have a Port, uh, Porto derby between Boavista and FC Porto, so uh, rather interesting there. Moving over to Spain, um, Valencia shock loss at home to Mallorca, similar Real Sociedad, who, who I had been praising <laughs> before uh, losing to Valladolid and of course Rayo 5-1. Rayo actually also starting to fly high again. Uh, but the first game that we have to talk with Real Madrid against Sevilla, because uh, for all the great stuff that Real Madrid uh, did in the first half, uh, taking a 1-0 lead early on through Luka Modric. Then they just wanted to control the game. Um, and for about 15, 20, 20 minutes, Sevilla actually fought themselves back into the game, getting equalizer through Eric Lamella. And uh, the game was in sudden a little bit on a knife's edge. However, it's then uh, Lucas Vasquez assisted by Vinicius Judy, a wonderful team move. And two minutes later, Fede Valverde hammering it out from far out uh, to make it a 3-1 decisive win. It's basically the individual quality of Madrid uh, prevailed there. Um, the Betis, uh, Betis Atletico Madrid game, this was a typical Atleti win, uh, it got to be said, because uh, Betis had more of the game. It was not the greatest of games, but they had more of the game. Uh, even took a lead, but that wasn't taken for offside. And then Griezmann scores too. A little bit with the first two shots of goal, they scored two goals. Uh, Nabil Fekir pulls one back in the 84th minute and they are pressing, but they cannot find the equalizer that they probably would have to have, have, have to have deserved. But this basically, this was Betis' chance to say, okay, maybe we can make a uh, push for a third place finish. Alas, it was not to be. Uh, Villarreal get a 2-1 over Almeria uh, as a notable shot. And then Barcelona also within 20, 20, 20, 20 minutes had the game against uh, Bilbao decided with Usman Dembele uh, being the outstanding player with scoring the first and then assisting uh, the next three goals overall. On the other side, I was really disappointed by Bilbao letting Barca play. Letting Barca play. I mean, uh, you see, if you give, if you're a little bit more structured, you're a little bit tight on, on the back, Barca have trouble. Uh, it, it, it was overall a really, really um, disappointing performance by Athletic Club and you know if you let uh, Dembele play he's an outstanding player however um, given what we've seen in the Champions League if you are a little bit more structured and you give a little bit more counter to Barcelona this team is really really struggling and I was surprised that Bilbao didn't take a more advantage of that. So with that we go over into the current weekend with the I mean the shocker result was definitely Cadiz um, winning 3-2 against Atletico Madrid, but it's also the way it happened. They take, uh, Bongonda gives Cadiz the 1-0 lead already in the first minute, and Atletico not really responding very well. This is a team that was just eliminated from the Champions League in very dramatic circumstances, also very much in the finding phase uh, at this point. Probably the move of Atletico uh, of Atletico trainer Simeone was to bring on Joao Felice in the 60th and also bringing on Griezmann for Correa and Carrasco respectively. I think Correa and Carrasco are more Atletico, you know, Simeone style players than especially for Joao Felice. Uh, Griezmann still, yes, he was. I'm not sure if it really works. The game seemed to be done when Fernandez makes it a uh, 2-0 in the 80, 81st hour. Joao Felice scores two within a space of four minutes. Uh, it's when he gets in Griezmann and uh, fully back and this is uh, the Joao Felice as I said in the intro that everyone is kind of he's a huge talent but he doesn't really fit the squad he's unhappy with, uh, with him but here he really showed up and then he had the big chance to make it even 3-2 in stoppage time and that would have been one of those stories that we would have been talk, 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 talking about however what happens in, in, in the end is that, that with the last chance of the game uh Sobrino in the well, it's 100 minutes scores a goal, and there was a slight handball there, but seemingly it was just enough. There were a few odd refereeing decisions, and we'll talk about a big one uh, in, in in a bit. But uh, it gives Cadiz uh, a big win, and Atletico Madrid are left wondering what could have been. Also left wondering as Sevilla losing one nil at home to Rio. They haven't had a home win yet. That's pretty amazing. 
I actually was fully invested to watching Valencia against Barcelona. However, it's a snooze fest. Um, my first question is why cannot Barcelona play at Valencia in their normal home jerseys? Yes, there might be a pants clash. It's not a big one. I mean, I think white against gold or whatever yellow Bar Barcelona's player is more of a clash and is harder to discern than if Barcelona will play in their traditional jerseys. I do not get it. I really do, do not get it. And I think if Barca would uh, play in red pants at Valencia, I think it should also be fine. I mean, they have been playing in red, red pants. So I really do not get that. The game, yeah. I honestly was a little bit disappointed by Valencia, but you know, given uh, their form is also up and down, um, Barcelona largely controlled the game, had more chances uh, without being all too convincing. Uh, it was a nice scene, David Villa uh, had the uh, honorary kickoff uh, and presented Gaia with his 300th game. But it was not really going to happen. Ferran Torres got, of course, booed once he came on. As came um, Gavi and Rafinha. And, you know, with Gavi coming around, there's a little bit more bite than with Barcelona. However, I always feel that he's a, an issue to get a red card. Uh, Valencia had a goal disallowed, but if you see it in the build-up, there was a clear hand, hand, hand ball. So, you know, that edge got taken out of, out of the game and then the Liverpool lead game for me took completely over. Um, and it's in the end, it's in the 93rd or third minute that a Rafinha cross that Lewandowski in his typical way gets uh, um, his foot on and makes it 1-0. Uh, it was a poacher's goal that is really, really, really hard to the and so Barcelona get a second win in in a row and despite all the naysayers you know Champions League out uh, and, and, and so on they get at least the wins against the teams that they should win however they don't get the wins against better opposition that's the one thing that maybe Barcelona Barcelona um, they, they also like Atl Atletico I think looks lost for Bar Bar Barcelona is that they think that they know what they want to but I'm always not sure if they can do it and uh, the team seems to be not gelling very well. Uh, speaking of not gelling, I'm not, I'm not saying that Real Madrid are, uh, are not gelling because on their day they're really good, but uh, it seems very much that most Real Madrid players are very much focused on the, on, on the World Cup and trying to get easy wins. And you know, when Vinicius Junior 70th makes it 1 0 against the Girona side, that honestly is playing actually quite some nice um, open football in a way. Uh, you think it is done and dusted. However, then comes the scene where uh, a penalty is given for a handball from Asensio. And I've watched this video. I'm not sure if the, the ball touched the hand. And I think Carlo Ancelotti was also. I mean, I hear, I hear so many conflicts. I mean, they're saying, yes, it did. I honestly, when I saw it, I have not really seen where, 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 where it touched. But then I hear other opinions that say, no, nah, it actually was a good call. Whatever, every the way the position was, if it hit the if it hit the hand, and I think it was a penalty. If it wasn't, yeah. Um, in any case, Duani makes it one one, and then the other one is that Rodrigo scored the goal ahead, had the goal. However, the Girona keeper had his hand on the ball, and by rule he cannot uh, pull put in. I personally have to say, I know it's a rule to protect a goalkeeper, and I guess I'm fine with it, but I. Personally, I have, have to say, I feel it a little bit of an odd rule overall. Uh, if I can hit the ball, I can hit the ball. So, I, I, I don't know. And then to top it off, Tony Gross gets his first red card, deservedly, uh, in the game. And it ends 1-1 ends one, one for Real Madrid. Athletic Club in uh, Kike Setien's first game for Villarreal. Uh, win 1-0. Only one is to say, Iñaki Williams. I mean, the game was not that great, but once Iñaki Williams scores the first goal, there were a couple of chances already for Athletic Bilbao, and seemingly everyone from Athletic Bilbao got a chance to score. They just didn't, and sometimes the misses were ridiculous. So it was only a 1-0. Uh, and Real Sociedad, um, yeah, it was uh, pouring rain. Um, it was a tight match. It was not the greatest overall. Um, and then in, in the answer, Cruz and then Borja Iglesias goal uh, that decide the game in Betis's favor, uh, who probably were the more complete team uh, there as well. And it's the evening Getafe win 1-0 at Elche, which means now that in the standings, I said it's only a point between Real Madrid and Barcelona. 
uh, it's still more favor Real Madrid um, and below, behind them. Yes, Atletico, Betis, it's, it's kind of tight up until Osasuna, which is a team we have not mentioned here. Uh, but it's very uh, so surprising to see them all up there. And Villarreal, not so much, but you see already when we see it, the uh, percentage chance of qualifying for the Champions League that Villarreal are actually the fourth favorite to make it in there. On the bottom, we see Sevilla all in there, but uh, definitely not a relegation candidate as of now. But, you know, they probably have to look at it this way. Uh, Elche seems to be gone. Cadiz also, despite the win against uh, uh, Atletico, but you also see it's rather, rather tight. Between Espanyol and Cadiz is only one point, and that's uh, quite a few uh, spots there. And I, I, I would not even say that uh, Valladolid, Mallorca and Almeria, but, uh, by any uh, stretch of the imagination, uh, safe there. Uh, is also see, I mean, from Arayo up, I think those are the ones that are going for Europe and from Valencia down will be midfield or even relegation fight overall. Um, maybe not quite as reflected in the expected standings, but we see it got a little bit tighter up top uh, with now the only one bomb in, in between. Athletic Club, this is where basically you can draw the line. These are the seven teams that will make it into Europe. Uh, everything below uh, may need, 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 need to be a surprise, but Sevilla is the one that probably will not make it. And I don't think Valencia uh, will also go in there. As I said, Elche seems to be a goner. The schedule in Spain does, does something very interesting. Um, as we'll see, my first off next week, and uh, we have the big um, Seville Derby, and Betis probably will are just waiting to beat uh, Sevilla in that one. I think Real Sociedad Valencia is also kind of an interesting one. Bounce back uh, game pro potential with Madrid uh, between uh, uh, Rayo and Real Madrid. Uh, Barcelona playing at home to Almeria, anything but a clear win there uh, would be a surprise. However, then it goes into midweek round and that's the last round before the World Cup. So uh, the Spanish team can actually leave a little bit sooner, which I found really, really interesting. If Sevilla wasn't a bad, I would say Sevilla Real Sociedad is the big game there. But, um, you know, there is not a really standard tie. Is also sooner doing well. We, um, so maybe also sooner against Barca could uh, be some, uh, something we have. Um, Valencia against Betis is a traditional match, but you know, it's, there's not really the big name fixture in there leading us into the World Cup and maybe some of the teams are not too unhappy about that. In any case, if I should have missed something, please add a line below. Also, if you want to add anything or you have a question or something, please drop a line below. Give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video and please subscribe to my channel if you want to see more videos like this and I will talk to you soon. Bye. Hey there, I really hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, here are some videos and playlists that you may enjoy too. Also, please consider subscribing to my channel and hit the little bell icon so you get notified whenever something happens in my soccer universe. And with that, have a wonderful day. Bye!